What's up, everybody? Welcome back. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Today's giveaway is MAPS Aesthetic. So this is the bodybuilding-inspired MAPS program. This is the program Adam used when he used to compete in men's bikini. And boy, did he look good. Justin used to comment on him all the time. Be like, look how sexy my friend is. Anyway, very effective program. If you want to win that program, here's what you got to do. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Do all three things. And if we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll win free access to MAPS Aesthetic. Also, we got a sale going on right now. 50 per, by the way, it's the last day for the sale. Okay, so today's the last day. Here's what it is. Half off MAPS Anywhere and half off the Fit Mom Bundle, which includes MAPS Anywhere, MAPS Hit, MAPS Anabolic, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. Okay, 50% off all those things. It's your last chance to take advantage of this particular sale. If you're interested, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code November 50. That's November 50 with no space for that discount. All right, here comes the show. All right, here's a fitness tip that I personally have to constantly learn myself. When it comes to training, more is not always better. This is a big lesson, especially for those of you fitness fanatics. You do more, you get better results until you stop and then you go backwards. All right, guys. That's not what my coach told me. Yeah, totally. So, How many yeah. times have you guys uh, had to relearn this particular lesson? Oh, man, this is probably one of the hardest ones because it, again, like as a joke, it, it was seriously like a mentality I had uh, in the gym. It, more intensity. Uh, I, I was like, I have to be there more often. I have yeah. to do this like almost every day of the week in order for me to get to the maximal level of achievement I can get. So I think what makes this one difficult is that less is not necessarily more here either, right? So there's the right dose. Exactly. So it's like normally when when uh, more doesn't mean more, m most often it means less means more. But in this situation, it's not always true either. It's like, so I think that, and it's also a moving target, right? So there's not like the, the perfect amount of volume and intensity that you apply every day, day in, day out, week over week, month over month. It's kind of this moving target all the time. So I think this is why we all kind of misjudge this. Even even with our experience, we still no, misjudge that's a, that's a good point. Uh, your lifestyle will determine what is the right dose of volume and intensity. Now, but here's a follow-up question to that. Okay, you're a fitness fanatic. Where do you tend to mess up? On the less or the more side? Oh, always. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why I'm always careful about this conversation because there's there's two very uh, distinct clients that come to mind when I think about this conversation. Yeah. And they're on polar opposite ends of the spectrum. You've got the client who is inconsistent, has never strung two months of working out three days a week uh, and, and is looking for every excuse not to work out or take a day off. Um, you have that one, and then you have the other one who is a fitness fanatic. They love to work out. They would swear they need to work out, um, and they love the sweat. They love the burn. They love the cortisol. And so that's why this is such a, a, a challenging conversation is most people fall in one of those two categories, and so you're, you're, you're trying to push one up, and you're trying to pull one back. You know, I'm going to add to that, though, because mm -hmm. I will say this. Even the inconsistent – people, people who never really make it a part of their lifestyle, they tend to overdo it when they do it. You know what I'm saying? Like they'll do nothing and well, then they'll yeah. do it and then they'll do too much. Right, right. So it's it's a message that's important, I think, for everybody to understand that there's a the right dose. And now here's where I always screw up, right? I learned, it took me a while to learn that if I did too much, I would overtrain. Not only would my body not improve, but it would actually start to go backwards. So it would be just require too much recovery, the adaptation process couldn't occur because my body was trying to heal all the time. I was beating myself up. So then I would scale it down, and then this is where I would fall. There's this like maximum amount of volume and intensity that you can tolerate, and then there's the optimum amount of volume and intensity. And oftentimes, the optimum amount is still less than what you can tolerate. Like I can work out, a, I can push the limit and not necessarily overtrain, but I'm going beyond what's necessary, which means I'm just slowing down my progress. And that's what I mess with now. It's like, oh, I think I could do more. I think I could do more. So I know what overtraining feels like, Yeah. but now it's hard to figure out the right dose because I still want to go and push harder and do more. Yeah. Yeah. But this is one of those things that's like, uh, if, you're, if your body's responding well, you probably should stick to what you're doing. And what we tend to do, I don't know about you guys, but this is when I overdo it. It's when I'm crushing. 
I'm doing great. Mm -hmm. And then my next thought is let's do more. With oh yeah. I don't, I don't overtrain or I don't tend to overtrain. I've learned now, right. When I get back, well, I shouldn't say that either too. So that's not true. So there's even like when I've been inconsistent for a while, um, many times when I get back into it, I know that obviously I can't return right to the same volume, the same level of intensity that I was training at, let's say a month ago or whatever. Uh, so I know better than to go all the way there, but I still tend to uh, do a little more than needed. And I'm always reminded of that the next day or two when mm -hmm. I see how sore I was and I go, and, but my attitude is different. Like when I was younger uh, and I'd feel sore like that, I'd be like, Oh yeah. That was a good workout. I did the right yeah, thing. I did, I did it. I got a good workout in. Where today, when that happens, if I'm really sore from a workout from the day before, I go, ah, oh, shit, I didn't need to do that much. That's how I think yeah. now. Um, and it is. It's still hard to gauge even after all these years. And what I've learned, too, is just that you, you it's almost like you can almost not do too little, right? So if I have, if you haven't been training for an extended period of time, say a month or beyond for someone who's, let's say at these holidays, have to get back into the swing of things like many people will, mm -hmm. um, you going to the gym and just doing five sets of squats and leaving is probably more than enough for a majority of people. Agreed. And, and you don't feel like that in your head. You think you need to do so much more. No, I, I agree with you. In fact, if, and this is really true for fitness fanatics who, who go off and then come back after a layoff is that the it's easier to to add more if you did too little than it is to pull back when you've done too much when you've done too much you're already in the hole your body's already trying to recover a lot and now you have to really scale back and allow that to happen but if you did like a really easy workout at worst you'll get a little bit of results but that's okay because you can scale it up the next week you don't have to pull back as much no. i think the big challenge is that we confuse healing and recovery with adaptation because yeah. they often happen at the same time. But healing is literally your body's healing itself from the damage. Adaptation in this context is going above and beyond that. So it's like body's healing from the damage. Now it wants to get stronger and more resilient so that next time that, that insult, that stress doesn't cause damage. But they're, they're different. So just because you recover doesn't necessarily mean you're adapted. Well, this one, yeah, it was definitely a hard one for me to realize because uh, there was this mentality that eventually your body's going to adapt. You know, if I keep sort of going intense and I keep adding more to, to the plate, uh, my body eventually has to overcome, you know, these these odds I'm facing, these challenges right in front of me. And that's like sort of the athletic sort of mentality of like, I could just get over all of these obstacles, uh, you know, eventually. And so to, to keep adding it to me was always like, well, I could just bust through all of this. And, and on the other side of it, yeah. uh, I'm going to be Hercules or whatever. Right. But uh, there's such a smarter way to, to go about it where you find that that right dose where, you know, your body's going to recover mm -hmm. and get, you know, uh, to a point where you're, you're, you're going to be working with your body and you're going to see results happen. And, you, and it's just going to be the snowball effect. Uh, if you pull back just a bit and find that sweet spot. I think a lot of that has to do with athletics. There's, um, I don't know if I want to say there's more room for air because you would think, oh, with the professional sports, that's not true. But you, with, with athletics, there's other adaptations that you're getting from quote unquote overtraining uh, mental. right yeah mental discipline and resiliency toughness. work yep. capacity right like and that those uh play in the favor of the athlete regardless of your sport it's hard to parse those out too right yeah, and, and you so you're getting so you may not like you may not get a tremendous uh, uh like increased speed or increased vertical or put on more muscle mass but you are going to get work capacity mental toughness you know stamina from mm. pounding the body like that mm -hmm. and so right. what i think happens to a lot of athletes is because they're they're getting those adaptations from train over training like that they assume that they're training the right directions when in reality there's a sweeter spot but i think that's why I, I, uh, people that are played sports have a harder time with you know this. it's funny i used to train this um well, i've talked about him a few times on the podcast he was an old older dude in his late 70s self-made millionaire loved him and he used to box back in the day um, he was from the East Coast, and then he coached boxers. So we would talk uh, the fight sports all the time. Those are really the only sports that I like to watch. So we had great conversations. And then we talked about heart, right? You've always heard like boxers being referred to as some of them having a lot of heart. And what does that mean, right? They can take a beating. They stay in the fight. They're scrappy. They don't give up. And we would talk about the, how to train for heart. 
And he said, you know what's funny, Sal? He goes, if you have, if you're really in shape and you have a lot of stamina and endurance, you automatically have a lot more heart. I said, that's a very good point. He said, oftentimes it's the more fit person that has more heart because he's not sitting there feeling like he's going to die. Right, right. He said, now, of course, it's also the mental aspect of it. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is you're right. You can train lots of mental fortitude by beating yourself up in the gym. But if you show up to your sport severely overtrained, you'd be as tough as you want to be. Your body breaks down, your body breaks down, and it doesn't really do you any good. So you have to be careful with balancing that out. But I do understand that. I know the military does that, for example. They don't – Yeah. They train people to get them fit, and then there's training that has nothing to do with improving your fitness. It's all about – yeah, we got to make you tough and, and well, see what you're made of. And in oh, yeah. a perfect world for athletes and even in the military or any case, like there's there's value in in training blocks of that. Totally. Right? So there's there's value in saying like, hey, this week, this is not about getting more weight up. This is not about us building any muscle. This is can you take it? Can you take the punishment I'm going to deliver to you for the next week? And that's going to transfer into game day mental fortitude. But then there's that, okay, we've trained that way now. Now let's also be more scientific with our approach on adding muscle, speed, agility, yeah. all these other but things. But in terms of uh, more, uh, I mean, there is a way to apply that that's really effective for athletes. And that's just, you just have to really manage your intensity uh, appropriately. And so that way you, you can, uh, I mean, it, it, it's everything you see in practice, right? If I'm dribbling, uh, and trying to get better at my, my handles and my skills for basketball, you know, the more often you do that, the better, but in, in terms of like, you know, weight training, it's, it's similar, but you have to make sure the load isn't too much. You have to make sure the stress isn't overbearing to where you're, now you're healing, yes. but you know, practicing it constantly does, uh, really propel you forward. No, dude, along those lines, it, there's lots of ways to add more, right? You can add more sets. You could add more frequency and total volume or more intensity. I will say this with intensity. If you manipulate your intensity, you can get away with a lot of frequency and volume. For example, I could take a very deconditioned person off the street and with a really low intensity, I could train them every single day. Mm -hmm. Or I could give them a 15-minute workout where I, I slam the intensity so high that I could probably send them to the hospital in a 15-minute workout. So intensity is the one variable that I like to manipulate the most. So if I increase the volume, I'll drop the intensity and then I can handle the volume. But if you go intense and high volume and all that stuff, yeah, you're going to be totally you're gonna be spinning your tires. So speaking of intense, you know what I read this morning? Crazy. I did not know this. So did you guys know that? Okay. So you guys have heard of chimpanzees going to war with each other. Have you heard of this? Going oh to war yeah. With each other? They're brutal. Bro. So chimpanzees have been observed in nature because they have their, you have, you built, they build their little clans. Yeah. And then they'll raid other clans and like rip their faces off. Violent. Yeah. Bro. Like terribly violent, like wars. Like, well, they tear them to pieces and kill the children. And they, it's just, they eat, they, I think they eat them. They'll stuff, eat them too, or yeah. drink their blood. It's crazy. Well, I did not know this, but there was a four year civil war between these two chimpanzee clans that was observed, I believe, in the 1970s. For four years? Wow. Four years. It started as one group, and I don't know what they call a group of chimp. Is it a Congress? I think it's a Congress, a bunch of monkeys. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> but anyway, it was, <laughs> is that it was true. I believe That's so. Maybe Doug could look it up. Doug, Fact look check up that, Doug. A group of monkeys right. is a Congress, <laughs> yeah. I think, if I'm not mistaken. Community. If it's not, it should be. Community. <laughs> Some political, but it sounds, political uh, joke that Congress South is probably better. <laughs> yeah, let's say Congress. It's actually Senate. No, Congress so, yeah. does mean something with monkeys. Anyway, so these these uh, a troop, a, a troop of monkeys is called a uh, troop. Yeah, a group of chimpanzees. Is this a troop? Anyway, yeah. so this this huge troop of of chimpanzees split off because one of them decided to become the alpha, mm -hmm. and two of the other males didn't like it, so they fought, and then it, car it, it created this divide. And over the course of four years, these two chimpanzee groups would go to war and would raid each other and kill each other and it was all observed and monitored Dude. so wild and i read about some of the things that they saw this woman who was a scientist she's like i would have nightmares after stuff that i would see like there was one case where one of them like killed the other one or something and was like drinking blood from its head and it's like this is like scary shit that chimps that were doing that's our closest relatives if yeah. you think about it really crazy yeah that's insane I had no planet idea. of the apes is already happening i guess oh, now does it, we're you, all paying attention to our phones and then you have the bonobos that just when you, you yeah, everybody. Yeah. when yeah. you read stuff like that does that give you um 
more empathy towards the ridiculous human behavior that we tend to see on what other side, what other, doesn't matter what side you are with a, with a topic that's going on. Like, and then this has been a great year for this, all this bullshit. <laughs> right? I think it reminds uh, us how like that's still in our DNA. That's why. Yeah. So that's my point, right? So if you, if you, if you subscribe to that, we evolved from these chimpanzees, right? That's our closest relative yeah. that that's, that's in, innate in us, right? So we have that's those are our natural behaviors, and over time we've evolved and we become more civilized. But you still have those deep down those tendencies, and so when you see people act out or act stupid or do these things that other people, oh my god, I can't believe that. Or we take these sides. Oh, oh I, I believe he's more right here. That person's more right there. A lot of this yeah. is just. Animal. I have two. There's two often sides of the coin that I'll fall on. Sometimes I'll look around and realize that. Mental illness is actually human. That's a part of the human condition. If you really think about the things that we do and then you try to apply logic to it, you realize that all of us are a bit mentally ill in that respect. Just all the stuff that we do. We make lots of decisions that don't make any sense. Like the things that we do that's bad for our health or how we, you know, we, we get all our egos get inflamed and we say things that, and if you really separate yourself, you're like, man, that's everything we do is oftentimes really dumb. Mm. But then on the flip side, when I read about primates and stuff like that, and you look at that, the fact that humans have created societies with hundreds of millions of people or billions of people, and we generally get along. We really do. Like, we live in a city with millions of people. I could walk around this city, go to the store, and I really don't feel like I'm going to get assaulted. No one's going to kill me or steal anything from me. Pretty sure my kids are, are safe at school right now. That's a bit of a miracle if you think about animals, right? That, yeah. So uh, one side, I'm like proud of how we've done things. And this side, I'm like, man, why are we so Dude, stupid? Dude, <laughs> I think the problem is groups. Mm. It, like anytime we start getting just like uh, together with too many people. Yeah, but there's a reason the why we ideas. always gravitate towards that. That's natural. It's tribal. It's, it's tribalism. Total. Yeah, and, and you see that in, in chimpanzees. You see that in, in you know the animal kingdom. Uh, and it's interesting if you kind of look back from a bird's eye view of how humans behave and interact and treat each other. It's usually like over a bigger thing that creates a, a yeah. shittier response. Yeah, but that's an interesting thought, though. Like, I mean, look what we do with family. I mean, it's our family, right? I was right? just going to say, you can't ignore the beauty with groups either. That's There's right. Two sides. That's right. There's the, we, we naturally gravitate towards that. And I, I guess I have... Like name and I think it's a numbers issue. Like right? name animals that take care of their sick. And I don't and necessarily old, think like it's always are. that bad that you gravitate towards family or close people that you have things in common with and you like. I don't think it always has to be a negative thing like a, we turn it into all the time. I think there's uh, nothing wrong if there's a group of people over here that enjoy doing these types of things that I have no enjoyment and I gravitate towards a group of people over here who enjoy uh, these things. You know what it is, bro? It's fire. Uh, okay, so when we discovered fire, <laughs> seriously, no, 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 I'm gonna tell you. No, I'm gonna give you the analogy right okay, now. Okay, okay, okay. Fire has the ability to warm us, to provide us with safety, cook our food, transform society. Also, could burn us, kill us, be used in war. All those things, right? If you look at human behavior in groups, you ever go to a concert and everybody's singing along and you feel like you're a part of this massive group and it's this incredible feeling, or you've been to a sporting event All or right. you've done something with your family. Yeah, group flow. Group flow. Yeah, but there's a it. there's a dark side. Yeah. And if you read about mob mentality. Right, it's powerful in both directions. It's exactly Ooh. what it is. And you can't have one without the other. You yeah. cannot have something that's so powerful that it, it causes, it creates this, this beauty and compassion and and it's simultaneously. I think can part of our has so much influence. Like a lot of times, people don't realize what's actually what how they're thinking, how they're behaving. Uh, a lot of times, they're just sort of reacting based off yeah. of like whatever group they're a part of. And, yeah. and it's 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 to me, it's it's been even more evident over the last few years than ever before. Yeah. Also, natural human instinct too. Though. There's certain people that were born to lead, that want to lead, and that and, and then there's lots of people that want to follow. They don't want to think about it. They don't want to make the decisions. They just want to be told what to do, and then they gravitate towards a, a group they feel comfortable in or confident in, right. and they don't want to make decisions. You they ever just read want the, to go along. You ever, I mean, read, that. you ever read the studies on stuff like that? Like I can't remember what it was, but there's this predictable pattern where – like there's there's a group of people and then there'll be that one person that like let's say like there's music playing and you're with a bunch of friends like like there's 50 of you and you're all family and friends and the music's playing and it's really good and then there's always that one person is the first person to kind of be brave 
stand up and start dancing. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what they called that person, but let's just say that's the leader. He's the maverick. But then there has to be the second person for this to cause a trend. Right. And there's always that second or third person yeah. that steps up and does it also, yeah. and then everybody else starts to follow. The early they, adopters. That's what it is. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. So, yeah. And there's this whole pattern of, of human behavior with that where, yeah. but then you look at mob mentality, which is very strange. People behave in ways in mobs well, that they would never act. They would never do see, a, a back to the chimp thing, uh, though, dude. I gotta say that uh, we definitely have like I'll, I'll fight anybody who doesn't think that we have some of that inside us of because, course. dude. <laughs> like, so I was watching TV and, and I look over and Courtney's on her phone. I'm like, "What are you watching?" Doctor Pimple Popper just. Oh, like looking at God. all this most disgusting, like Jessica why? Likes that. And like you know, pulling ticks off, and like like th there's something weird about Bro, that, that. If I have a blackhead or something on my back, yeah, and I don't let Jessica go to town, she's actually angry with me. Yeah. She'll get mad at me, and I'm like, "Why do you want to do that? That's disgusting. Exactly. Like, that's chimp. Tell me. Behavior. Tell me that's not chimp. I tell DNA. her that too. I say, "Babe, that is your monkey instinct." So I think the answer. <laughs> I think the answer is is us instead of us trying to change this or deny it, is to find a, find ways to uh, evolve and work with it, opposed to you totally. know like yeah. denying that. It's, acknowledge it. Yeah, acknowledge that it is part of uh, our our past. Acknowledge that that's well, probably what we came from. That it's there's probably a lot of natural instinct for you to act a certain way and that it takes a lot of discipline and self-awareness to be able to i agree to be able to unpack that and go like mm, maybe i shouldn't act i this agree way. you yeah. have to we have to acknowledge these these biological uh drivers before we can become aware of them and either embrace them or work in a way to where those biological drivers don't become destructive like you know someone cuts you off you might have this biological drive to you know, go beat someone up, right? But you're aware, like, oh, okay, I know where that comes from. I'm not going to do it. And I'm using an easy one that everybody agrees with. But I agree with you. I think it's important that we identify and admit and say, because a lot of people are like, no, humans are a clean slate. There's no biological drivers. That's bullshit. We're still animals. But we need to acknowledge well, these it's, biological it's, drives and, and our instincts and then work around them. It's like the case that, who are we talking to that was making that for monogamy? That that's why. I mean, it's it, in your natural as as a male. It's in your n natural human instinct to want to mate with multiple mates. Tons of but novelty. yet, but yet, yeah, but yet, we've decided that monogamy is the way to go for civilization. Yeah, but it, it makes sense. Better. Yeah, it works better for a society that you don't want to be at war and trying to kill yeah. each other and clans. Because if right. if one or two guys was taking fifteen or twenty. If we were in a, in a group and there's a hundred people in our entire clan, half half men, half women, and three guys took a majority of all yeah. the women because of the their most attractive, the strongest, whatever. What ends up happening with all the rest? They're going to try and overthrow or kill. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it, I mean, so it makes sense that there. That's natural. I mean, that's what I took from when when Katrina and I read Sex at Dawn. Like there, obviously, there's some people that read that book and then said, "Oh, this is the way we're supposed to be," and so that make an excuse for. Yeah you know, sleeping with everybody and saying that open relationships is the better way to go. What I took from that or what her and I both took from that was like, I think there was just a, a compassion for each other, especially sure. I think for her, the way she looked at me as a man, that it's in my, in my nature to want to do those things. And it takes effort and work for me to resist those not things to. and choose not discipline. to. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. No, it's that discipline. It's, I mean, it's no different than uh, ab ab abstaining from crappy food all the time or not just being lazy. It's the same thing. You know, historically, what has helped, and this is just a fact, what has helped humans evolve in this direction are spiritual practices. Spiritual practices, this is what they do. And the more that we, and I don't care what spiritual practice it is, uh, that's typically what they do. That's why they stick around for thousands of years is they help, they allow us to evolve beyond these instincts to become better and work better together. Uh, but as we start to throw spiritual practices away, and we're going to see more and more people being like, oh, I can just... Do you think that it's more of the, the spiritual practice or that it it provides a, a moral fabric for you? That's a big part. That's 100% part of it. I mean, I feel like it, that's like the that's like the main thing that I would think is that it, otherwise, if, if you don't, if you don't have morals, then why not? steal why not cheat why not sleep with everybody why not do if everything's things? subjective right that's right humans are smart i could sit here and make an argument for a lot of things right 
I could sit here and say, oh, it, you know, it's it's cool. survival of the fittest. There's there's food at the grocery store. I'm just going to take it. Why mm-hmm. not? Why not just take it? You oh know? no, people can I make. Need it for argue- my, I need it for my family and for them to be able to eat. Yeah. Why can't I sleep with that person? We like it. They like it. Doesn't matter if they're you know this person or that person or whatever or you know. I get it. That subjective nature. If everything's subjective, that can cause destruction because we're so smart that we can rationalize almost anything. But if you have objective, like here's the rules. This is objective the way it is. Uh, that's always wrong. So let's not do that. This is probably the right thing to do. Then we tend to work better. Well, if you don't do that, you're just going to get swept into whatever the culture and society tells you, yep. uh, you know, are the, the moral uh, ideas of, of the moment. And totally. So it's, that's all I'm seeing now. It's like, these aren't even ideas. People are just making things up now, uh, you know, to, to, to create as the standard of morality. Yeah. Well, let me tell you what's not smart. <laughs> What'd buying a foot, 15 foot Christmas tree Bro, and that thinking, picture, it's gonna be, <laughs> thinking it's going to be no big hold deal. Hold on a second. <laughs> you got to explain this to me. So I see the picture. You have a big ass it truck. Does it, the, the pictures and the videos that I've sent family and friends, it does not do it justice until Bro, you that's actually- like a, that's like a tree that's in the forest that you yeah. look up at. The, my, my ornaments are this big. So the ornaments that go on it. So that, did you bring the chainsaw and, and no, 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 no. get so down the, or what? So no, no, no. This this tree's uh, well. That requires some planning to cut a tree. Like yeah. That. So how big was it? Well, I'll not only that, mic. it's actually hard to find really a like aesthetic fifteen foot trees. Okay, you can find ten footers, uh, eight footers all day long. Finding a fifteen like this was shipped from Oregon, right? So I had to, the only reason why I even went early, right? So I broke all my rules. I've never done Dang. this before <laughs> Thanksgiving. I called around. And I'm looking for a pre-cut 15 to 20 foot tree. Like we're going all Griswold style right this year, right? So I'm looking for that. The, and I went down the first day it opened because they only get like 15 of them. They ship them all the way from Oregon. They come down and then like, like the biggest tree farm here in the Bay Area only gets like 15 to 20 of these trees. So I went down there as soon as they got them, so I could kind of have my pick and and figure out which one I wanted. Bro, like, there's like squirrels in there. <laughs> Actually, you do. You when you when you open it all up, there's like nest and crazy stuff like that. It's like, yeah, no, it was. I mean, the 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 trunk of this motherfucker was every bit that big. How did you like, how did you move? Well, I don't. So I don't know what I said. First of all, it took five Mexicans to load it up in my truck. So, <laughs> I mean, that's so you knew it was no deal. And that's by. I mean, I said that earlier. Someone was just like, "You can't say that's real. That's a compliment. That's not fucking racist, right?" Yeah. That means it would take ten white guys to get it up <laughs> oh on my truck. That's yeah. how crazy this thing was. Math. Yeah. And I got. And when I get home, all I have is Katrina's seventy-something-year-old dad and her at the house. So it's just you three. So the three of us. Get it from my truck now. So you go, you went from you went from five to three Mexicans now. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So uh, we did, we did get it. Boy, was it a, it was a hell of a time. So I had so you need like ropes and everything to kind of stabilize dude, it, like. and it, and I had to get them at the at the tree farm to mount the stand on it, right? The, and the stand is you know every bit you know six feet, yeah, you know six feet wide or oh, whatever that to support something like that. I had to tie it to my banister at the top of the stairwell, so just because I was scared to death, like this yeah, thing come down on max topple. or something yeah. like that. So it's on the stand, and then behind the tree, I have my stairwell, and I've got like s- strings attached to it just to make Matt, sure that decorate it. it. What hilarious. are you doing? Going up the stairs using a ladder? Uh, both. I so I have a twenty foot ladder plus stair on the hanging over the stairs and oh man it was i tell you what never again (laughs) never again well so let me ask you so how are you going to keep it from getting really dry because it's a bit early isn't it yeah it's a little early i mean you it's it's kind of a thing that i'm so i'm if you give them water every day like you're supposed to they'll they'll last you know what you're gonna hate what when it's time to take it down oh i i'm paying somebody a hundred percent to do that i am not after fucking with it like that i will find somebody that was all day yeah. You were doing that thing all day. It was all day. It was scary. It was a headache. It was like, it was way more than I thought it was going to be. Like in my head, like all I was really thinking was the height of it. And I'm like, okay, I, I've got 15 to, tw- I think I have 20 foot ceilings right there in that entryway. So I'm like, you know, it's somewhere between 15 to 20 feet is, is what I want. Um, and I, and I, and I have a huge like open front area. So I'm like, I can get, a, I know that's plenty of room for a tree. But this thing is so big that it like it comes all the way out to my stairwell, and you open the door, you get like a drone to drop the angel dude, on top. Dude, it's <laughs> it, the the fake ones would have been way better. Way I, I, next year, it's fa- I'll get a big tree again, but I'll buy a fake one uh, for that front because 
lugging that around, getting it up, like scary, difficult, no, no thing, messy. Yeah, it's just way more than what I thought. Like I didn't think. Now it was are you be going? Now you got a massive tree. Are you going to go like all out with all kinds? Are you going to get like the big inflated Santa and the sleigh and all that stuff? Uh, I'm I'm less. So, I, I, we do. We have a snowman and like a little welcome sign that will go out in the front. I don't do the outside that much. I like the inside done, mm. and that's like mm. selfish. I and like, you like it all uniform, right? So it's all what well, you pick like two colors, three colors. Yeah, yeah. What are they? Yeah, so we did black and white. Black and white. Yeah, we did. It. Never done that before, which is I really I've already done it. I've yeah, because last year what'd you do blue, blue, and it was like silver and blue I, or white and blue. I don't. I think last year I did the I did the sharks colors, and then the sharks colors and red. Yeah, but I'm I have a weird thing about I've told that on this podcast, haven't I? Have yeah. I talked about that before? My weird fetish with not having like a like a, I like a Macy's tree. You know what I'm saying? Like the all. Uniform. Wait, how do you like a Macy's? What do you Christmas mean fetish? Porn. You know, like, no, 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 no. Like, Macy's is like, you, you're the Macy's catalog. Doug, you, you know what I mean, Adam? right? Yeah. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, yes. it's. I mean, everything's uniform. There's like a color palette yeah, that they it's use. It's not a bunch of Christmas colors. Yeah, it's which like that, so I, I grew up as a kid, which I, and this is not a knock on families that love this. I just couldn't stand it as growing up. Like, the, we had like the popcorn strings yeah. and then like, you know, the blinking lights on the bottom, then the still lights on the top. Those bubbly, and, like, old school. Everything. Ones. Like, it was literally like what it was is you know mom brings the christmas stuff out that we've had for 20 years yeah. and some stuff works some do does it's like it. christmas exploded yes yeah. and there's like you know, ornaments from all of us as we grew the up through kids. with your dumb like first grade picture yes on it. she yeah. loves it and i love that she loves <laughs> I got it that. but for me like i'm particular about the way my house looks and i gotta look at this thing for a month and a half or whatever like that like i want it to to flow and look good oh, that's, and, well, that's awesome it's a good i mean it's one of those was it type two fun right you're gonna look back on this and remember. yeah i mean now that it's up and it's all done it's really cool and people walk in they're like holy shit yeah. you know so it's got the cool wow factor to it um and i mean imagine that big of a tree it makes the whole house smell good mm. uh, so yeah. you know normally you get a little eight foot tree and you can smell it in the house like imagine a big Dude, ass my buddy one time <laughs> got a big ass tree it wasn't like that but it was a big tree and he cut it down brought it home put it up and didn't know that there was like an like a bunch of ants in there and then <laughs> like, the, yeah, dude. like the next day <laughs> the dude, ants termites everywhere in. in his house yeah see i yeah. bought so they they had the the tree farm over and you know where it's at over by san martin morgan hill you guys are drive on south yeah. 101 the big huge tree farm so i they have a, a farm up in oregon where they grow the monsters at and so yeah. this thing is like and that's the thing if you go cut something like this it's like crooked yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's like you know it's this thing is perfect it's yeah. literally, it's even all the way around and like they, it's GMO tree. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I'm yeah, this, sure. this weekend we did uh friends giving. So we do this every year where not on Thanksgiving, but it's usually around there. We'll invite some of my cousins over and we're all just going to hang out. But this year was a little different because we didn't do it last year because of, you know, everything that was going on. So we just said, we're going to do it this year, but now, so I have, we had our son, right? He's a year old. My brother had his baby, which now I believe he's three and a half or four months old. My cousin Gabriel had his baby about two months ago. And my cousin Alex, his wife is due in a couple months. So they didn't have the baby yet. but So we had three babies and then we had other families come. So everybody got together. We got the babies all together, which was awesome. <laughs> so we could all, we put them all on the, on the rug and took pictures. And yeah. then at halfway through the night, I told my, my cousins and my brother, so let's take the kids for a walk. So it's like a bunch of dudes walking three babies. You should have seen the looks. We got in the neighborhood. <laughs> oh, People bet. are looking at us like three men, three babies. Do you guys know what you're doing? Like, where'd your wives go? Like, what's going <laughs> on? It's hilarious. But we, you know, we took them for a while. And then my son is he's such a lover. He is like the biggest. He would go up to the baby and Aurelius? He, my, or no, Aurelius. Domenico. But well, my oldest is also, but okay. but it's my my one year old, you know, you don't see that you start to see these things kind of develop, mm -hmm. right? So we have this little he got this little teddy bear. And I could already see it with his teddy bear because he squeezes it and he kisses it and makes all these noises. The, one, the same noises we make when we hug him and stuff. He's very touchy-feely. Well, anyway, with the babies, he'd go up to the baby and he'd make this little voice, which I know where he got. He got it from Jessica. When Jessica is like playing with him and she wants to hug him, she makes like this little cute voice. Mm -hmm. So he did that. And then he would go and gently touch their face. And then he'd go like this. He'd, he'd put his hands up to his own face and go... Mm. Like he wanted to squeeze the baby. <laughs> so we videotaped the whole thing. It was oh, so, that's great. so adorable to oh, see them all so together. Good. Yeah. So we had a lot of fun and we're all hanging out. But it's nice because now we see like this next generation, you know, is going to be growing up and it's just so. 
It's so cool. Now, have you guys have you guys done your like getting your turkey and all stuff like that? Like, what's the? Uh, I hear everything's gone up. Oh, right? Everything's bro. like double the price, Prices. or one and a half times the price, or something. I know like that. that turkeys are fifty percent or something like that. I heard expensive. a bunch of stuff have, has gone up. Yeah, I got one ahead of time to bring up. Yeah, because it's going to be crazy right now, especially like uh, Courtney's already been trying to like gather stuff uh, because. We're going to be cooking just for ourselves and like her sister, like in, uh, we're supposed to have our whole family up there, but they're like sick and not being able to make it. Uh, but yeah, so the, I guess the grocery store has been crazy, like slammed and, and, you know, prices have been going Isn't up. Is everything up right now? Well, so check this out, right? So pork, I believe bacon is 28% more expensive in the last 12 months, all pork products, beef, is going up, turkey definitely. But yeah, pork is going up, and they say that it's probably not going to slow down. Now, here's the crazy part, right? And this is why I think some companies in this environment are just going to crush. So companies who are positioned well to weather the inflationary storm that don't necessarily need to raise their prices or at least can wait uh, the longest before raising the prices, like for example, okay, pork is up 28%, which is huge over the last 12 months, right? right? Meanwhile- Butcher Box still has their sign up now and get bacon for life. Bacon get, for life. Get bacon in your box for life if you sign up right now. Yeah, now they're crazy. positioned well because they're a direct, you know, to consumer product. They deliver to your door. Lots of middlemen are eliminated. So I feel like companies like theirs are just gonna crush because yeah. people are gonna they were already saving you money. Mm-hmm. But now you're saving so much more because everything has is, is you know gone through the roof. I wonder if they they turn that that thing back on like because they, they were they were just doing the turkey just recently they're always like, yeah. like they did the salmon not long before that I wonder if they knew that that's going on with bacon and so they intentionally actually switched yeah. back Dude, over that. Speaking of food, you, uh, you inspired me. I know you guys went to a really nice restaurant uh, not that while ago, not that long ago. So I wanted to go to a nice restaurant. It wasn't nowhere near. It wasn't a Michelin rated one. But there's a new restaurant in the Prune Yard called Bisteca. Have you heard of this place? I've heard of it, but I haven't been there yet. I haven't heard of oh, it. Oh, bro. The experience was amazing. Really? It was so fun, so good. They had this one dish. It was a bone marrow dish. And they bring it out on a tray. And there's you know beef bones like this just stacked on top of each other. Mm. And they're seasoned and just incredible. And then they give you another tray with all these things that you can add to the bone broth, like bacon bits and and mm. breadcrumbs and just all these different interesting flavors. And then they had this like um, garlic bread that was fried and thin. And so you take the, and then they give you another tray with gloves and tools because you're going to wear the gloves because you're going to get messy. So like the whole restaurant is like this. It's like a huh. bunch of fun, oh, that's cool. interesting dishes that you can order oh, and cool. really, really good restaurant. I highly recommend you guys. So they put and it's you close. To work. And it's close. How's the tab? Is it like- how, It's expensive. It is. Yeah. It's not as expensive as uh, like what you like where you went, yeah. but it's up there. Okay. It's, it's definitely not a place you're going to go every single week. It's like a special occasion. Wow. In the Pruneyard, place. yard, huh? Prune yard. What, where did they replace? Do you know where they were? You have, you have the Pacific Catch on this end. You've got the- It's, uh, it's so if you look you at got Pacific Luna Catch, in the middle. It's to the right. And it's one of the, it's like right there on the, on the end. And you'll, by the way, bisteca means steak in Italian. Just want to let everybody know. (laughs) So is it technically an Italian steakhouse? It's got a tie-in, definitely influence, but it's not like a traditional Italian restaurant. I want to go, dude. Maybe. I mean, here's the okay. Give you an idea, right? So it's really nice, nice waiters, lots of fun. Everything's different. There's great dishes, dishes that are different. For example, we ordered this pasta dish that was like pumpkin, and it was like something you would never anticipate. It was really good. At the very end. They gave they gave us a probiotic drink. So oh, at the end of your meal, here's a really? probiotic drink to help you digest. And then they gave us these plastic little bags with our bill. And they said, "There's a candy table over there. You can take as much candy as." You. And then it went to the candy table, and it's all these old school candies in this. Bag. Oh, interesting! Really interesting. Huh. Can I go like this, the way I'm dressed, or is it more? You can do whatever it, you want. White tablecloth. <laughs> yeah. You know what's funny? What that I noticed in the Bay Area? You go to a nice ass restaurant. There's always like you know. People who it's expensive, so they're obviously they've got money, but they're all like these tech dudes and stuff that they don't care. They'll wear baseball caps and 
you know, <laughs> yeah, turtlenecks. Shorts and, 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 I don't care. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I looked around. You see nice, yeah, nice dressed here people. here has any sense of fashion. I was telling <laughs> Jessica, honest. like, I was like, you see the dudes that are wearing like baseball caps and shit? I bet they're, worth, they're all worth hundreds of millions of dollars oh, from, yeah. you know, Google or something like that. Yeah, there's some yeah. like tipping point, right? Like once you get uh, money and then at a certain point you go revert right back to like wearing it's, sandals. Speaking of rich tech billionaires and stuff like that, did you see the, the, the speech that uh, Bernie Sanders came out and was talking about, about the government funding uh, – Elon Musk and uh, Amazon and Bezos for their the rocket. Their oh gosh, did you see his whole thing? I didn't thing? see it. No. Did you hear the All In guys talk about this? No. Oh, they were they were roasting the shit out of them for giving giving or Bernie Sanders giving them a hard time about government helping and funding that. And he's like, do you know how much NASA has spent on? Oh, on I know. You can't computer? compare. Like three hundred and sixty billion dollars. Yeah, you can't compare. You know how much Elon and them spent? Yeah. Like six billion. Yeah. Go- like, government funding hmm. is taxpayer. That's funding. well. That what was yeah. so. That's why I thought it was so ironic. Is that you've got Bernie Sanders coming out here talking shit all about the, about the government helping fund SpaceX, right? Yeah. And where they have conservatively built this thing already past what NASA was doing as far as they're on, on in this pursuit, right? Yeah. And yet NASA spent less money. Three hundred and sixty. Yeah. Yeah. It's like well, that's exactly what you want. But no. the way, the narrative is that oh, giving billionaires more money, like. And yeah. it's and it's that this is and you got a bunch of people that are on board with it that hear Bernie say that and they're like yeah fuck the billionaires yeah. but nobody's thinking logically like wait a second it's it's their brilliance that has been able to get to the where they're at and and being able to do it on so little money in comparison to what it looks no, like when we let government nobody dictate spends that money worse than people who pay no yeah. consequences for wasting it yeah. so you're taking other people's money then you're basically you're getting elected to to do something with other people's money and if you don't spend all that money you lose funding so it's in your best interest to spend the hell out of it and you have a bureaucracy of people underneath you that you employ and you can't become efficient because oh no we're going to lose jobs it encourages uh wasteful spending it's yeah just, i just, just don't i don't get it at all like you you, you demonize like uh, somebody that's like a billionaire like that like making uh, everything more cost effective, efficient, and all. I mean, you're glorifying a politician for saying something you like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they don't do shit. Well, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> like, what are we even talking? You about? You know what it is? Is that we attach greed to money. First of all, greed is a human. It's a it's a part of human nature. It's not. It's an ugly part of human nature, but it exists. We think it has to do with money. It's it's. Is it more noble to have political greed, for example, than monetary greed? Right. If you're a billionaire in America, you're pro- unless you're tied in with the government and you could take people's tax money, you probably made your billions, even if you're a greedy son of a bitch, you, were, you made your billions because you did something that other people liked and gave you their money, yeah. right? Political greed, that's a whole different story. I mean, you mm. twist and turn and you, mm-hmm. you know, create narratives and do your thing. And so greed is greed and it's bad regardless, but uh, it doesn't disappear just because you take away, just because someone's a billionaire and someone's a politician doesn't mean the politician isn't greedy because political greed can be <laughs> yeah. just as bad, if not worse. Mm-hmm. So anyway, interesting stuff. Speaking of interesting stuff, Justin, that Instagram page that you uh, showed us. <laughs> Are we going to talk about this? Which one? Vintage. Um, the cheese one? You're going to share that? Bro. Oh okay, my God. I thought that was so like an inside thing just for us. I thought- No? Okay, interesting to listen. me. Well, oh my God. Did you see like today's- I came across a page because the name, right? Because it said cheese? cheese. <laughs> You're so dirty, bro. It's completely different. It's, uh, yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's like old school kind of- It's like old school porn. Models, uh, that well, it's you, on Instagram, so it's not going to show you. Oh my god, like oh. that's like a fucking well, it's like, like what does that mean? Plus, Instagram, uh, Instagram, it's today. like 60s style okay. and like it's cool older stuff. too. Hey, think of the irony of that though. Instagram today is way more provocative than than the Playboy was when we were kids, yeah. like, probably. It, what do you mean, probably? Well, maybe sure. not. We were Playboy? kids in the 80s. Playboy show. All I know is they look like they're having a lot more fun back then. So yeah. that's why. Well, it's, so what it does, it attention. shows like pinups and like, but it, all, it doesn't just show that. It shows like classic ads and weird stuff and yeah. pictures that people took of themselves, like, you know, you know, like a bunch of dads, you know, drinking beers and it's like, you know, 1970s and, you know, they're smoking cigarettes, holding kids yeah. and shit. And, so. and, then, and then lots of boobs, like, Be- uh, uh, you know, every now and then. <laughs> but old, like, it's it's interesting yeah. how how they did things then versus I can't now. believe you brought that page up. I think that yeah. was funny. You I just thought that. it was funny. Just, yeah. uh, yeah. 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 That's the kind of stuff I'm looking yeah. at. I mean, I'm guys. following now. I'm yeah. interested, you know. So. I, I, dude, I love old pop culture. I don't care what it is, whether it's that or ads. You ever go, if you ever Google, like, ads from the 60s, 
it'll blow your mind. The way that they sold products and stuff, yeah. it, it, like nine out of 10 times, it's totally inappropriate. It's a whole Mad Men I stuff, wish we right? could do some of that yeah. stuff. Do you want to make your husband happy? You know, yeah. it's like this wife that's you know, like, oh my God, that's how they sold products oh, to women. Mad. What the hell's going on? Oh, yeah. It's just, it's it's pop culture. It's It'll show you just how much we've come along in certain things. We, and how we've made Fast, it. Oh, really yeah. fast when you think about it. Bro, do you know that the Flintstones Cartoon for kids. Do you know who the main sponsor was for Flintstones back in the day? Probably cigarettes or something. Marlboro. Yeah, oh, see, yeah, yeah. At the very mm. end of the, com- of the did they ever? And you know what? Did they ever show cartoon characters? Sm- oh, I guess all Pe- the time. Pepe Le Pew smoked cigarettes, right? Not only was he smoking cigarettes, bro, he was putting himself all over a female. Well, yeah, that was but pushing I mean, him I'm talking about these <laughs> cigarettes and alcohol, though. Is there any other any other cartoon? Yeah, Tom character? and Jerry would smoke. Oh, yeah, he, he yeah. Well, even no, Pinocchio. Yeah. I mean, it, it was more cigars, but there, there was like that whole island where they're doing right. a bunch of bad stuff. Yeah, you know, all these kids. Dude, was- speaking of like pop culture and craziness and bad stuff, I saw on Netflix, Tiger King Part Two was out. Did yeah. you guys watch it? I, I did not. It. Yes. Okay. So okay. is it is it a is it a flaming shit show? Or? Okay. So here's, well, the first one was. But it's you a still disappointment. Watched. I'll just go. Ahead oh, and say it is. It. Oh, really? Right yeah. Because and I've watched about three of them now, and, and honestly, it to me, and I don't know if anybody else felt this, but it just seems like recycled. Uh, shot like B-roll stuff oh, from, like, that they're previous. trying to kind of string together to make a show out. Oh, that makes that sense. Sucks. You know, and then uh, they just like, yeah, they're trying to give like different angles on things that, uh, that happened within the first season. Oh. And I'm like, come on, dude. Like I, yeah, so I was a little disappointed because I, I am all about you know this this crazy like white trash like experience. It, it was <laughs> amazing. The first one really got me, dude. Uh, I loved so it. So does it not feel like anything is current? And they literally are just ripped because that makes sense that they would pull some bullshit like that where they're like, you know, we have so much B roll. This none whole, of it this whole story current, is dude. crazy. Let's just show yeah. It. It, it's like it's like side angles of like uh, lawsuits that you didn't really get uh, the other side from Carol Baskin and his and her husband and. Um, and, and then it, also just like the back and forth of like how she got so vindictive and, and came at like his uh, parents, um, whatever his name is, the the main guy with the mullet. Um, so, yeah, it just it was all these like kind of side angle stuff of like how all these interactions happen and then what they're paying for it legally. And, and I, I just love how in the first one, nobody had a, like a full set of teeth. Like nobody. Yeah. Oh, and they got into the, uh, you know, his boyfriends that turned into his husbands. And yeah. And this, they're like, and then how they came out later, they're like, I'm not even gay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, That's where are, I lost yeah. my shit. I'm not, I'm not gay, but <laughs> meth is meth. I ain't even gay, man. Yeah. Well, I, what always makes me curious <laughs> like, is, okay, any idea, Doug, maybe you can look for this, is uh, what do they get paid? Like, did they make about who made who makes all this money for the second the second follow up right? Like, I do, think the Tiger King makes some money off of it. I don't know because the producer. So I don't know if Isn't you remember. He in jail? But, well, so how's the, he making that money? It, it all got burned, right? Like a lot of the footage, and because it was locked up under this guy, oh, this producer's right. that fire control, and then there's a fire about it. So I'm wondering if you know, all this B-roll stuff was the only thing legally that they could probably patch together. Mm. Um, yeah, like, who's making all the money for this? I don't know. Is it Carol? Is it the Tiger King who's in jail? That's is it the people question. who produced it and made the show? Like, is it Netflix that's going to get the, get, is going to make the ba- biggest mm. bang for their buck out of this? Who who makes out that bitch by Bass. running that a second follow-up like that? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. You know what's funny? Do you guys think the Tiger King would have exploded had it not happened On during COVID? the lockdown? I think it was bu- beautiful uh, timing. Yeah, I think it would have taken longer. Uh, I think it would have been a cult classic, maybe. You know, like mm-hmm. it would have had like a smaller following, but it definitely. I wouldn't up. have watched it. I was just at home, nothing to do, and I'm like, Pff. you know. And <laughs> well, you know, it makes you feel better well, about yourself. That's exactly. Okay, you guys know yeah. my whole thing, right? Yeah, right? When I get sick, what do I watch? Right? Trash. And, it, and that has to do with just when you watch trashier shit on TV when you right. don't feel good. At least good. I'm not that guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess it ain't that bad. I got this little flu. I'll be over this, you know? So you got to <laughs> think there's something to that. I can't be alone, right? I can't be alone on this. And you got all, you got millions of people stuck in their home from COVID and stuff like that. You got to think that what a, per- that's like the home run. 
That's that like the it, home run. I feel like the move. timing was. Uh, no, I don't think they planned it right. I think it just it got. I think he got lucky that it, yeah. it came out that. But I agree with you too, though, Justin. That regardless, it's a crazy enough story that it eventually would have gone viral and enough people would have shared it. Yeah. But I definitely think that COVID accelerated that. Yeah, for you, sure. don't, you don't want to feel down on yourself and then watch like this amazing story of some super successful, motivated. Yeah. You know, he's yeah. like, oh man, I'm, I'm, I feel worse. Yeah, well, yeah. dude, I remember like in 2020, there was a whole period of I don't. Know, it was like four to five months where uh, it finally got to the point where everybody's watched everything that yep. was out and that there was nothing new and it was like we were all just dry Dude, any kind of content I, and then that came out I we tell you like, oh. I tell you no the best was when uh, when Adam first became a dad there was like that three or four month period where he literally watched yes. every oh, single... Oh, I know. He was reporting to us, like, every, <laughs> every, every documentary, he everything. Burnt, he, like, burnt holes in I his Felix Grey glasses because oh, he was watching so much that you were just... Oh, you would always come God, in. Dude. And you talk about something you watched, oh. and I'm like... Dude, you watch like, your Felix Grey glasses, my son right now, like, he just... He thinks it's the cutest thing to, like, put him on and stuff. Why? I, probably because you guys think it's cute and you tell him it's cute. Oh, yeah. and he, Well, yeah. it was originally, but now he's, like, a little bit bigger and stronger, so he, like, grabs him and, like, pulls him, and I'm like, ah! Uh, uh. <laughs> I have a pair that literally they look like this now oh, where, no. where he's bent the Speaking show. of Felix Gray, I think they're still running. Doug, are they still running their, their Black Friday or whatever sale <clears throat> that's going on? Yeah, through December 2nd, 15% off. Everything. Everything. They never do discounts. They don't, they don't yeah, do they sales. They never do them. They don't, no, they don't do any of that stuff. You're, you're too good for that. Your boy's a big kid, man. He's so tall. He's Yeah, he's slanking out a little bit. I mean, this is the first time you guys have been with him in a while, right? When he came down here the other Every day. time I see him, he looks like he he's grew starting like a to, half an inch. to say a bunch of new words. Huh? Yeah, so now he's like... Uh, he just randomly will say like a word now, like it's and it, you'll like you we're starting to get him to to say it again too. So we're definitely like moving into it. And I'm like kind of torn, right? I was waiting for this moment, like oh, I can't wait to have a conversation with him. But then there's that part where you're probably gonna miss him not being able to communicate yeah. and talk, and then the, the, this phase that we're in right now. Bro, so. you just wait. You literally, you just wait because so Facebook does this thing where it, it'll say like five years ago, ten years ago today, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It destroys me. Yeah. I, my daughter just turned twelve, and a post comes up, and it's like you know, uh, you know, eight years ago today, and it's this. My daughter was this little tiny kid, and I wrote a story about something she said to me. Like in that story, I wrote that I told her, I said, "Oh my God, honey, you're so." She was like four or five. Like you're gonna be before you know it, you're gonna be a teenager. Like you're growing so fast, and she goes, "I'll always be your daughter, Papa." Oh. And, and then now she here she is. I feel like that's what one she of the things I'm a big. You know, door. we so we talk so much <laughs> shit about Facebook and how shitty Facebook is, but that's where uh, that's their home run to me. Like that's the part. Think that, of the history that they'll own, right? That, All what, that stuff. That's, that's why I think I think own timeline. The future yeah. of like funeral homes is gonna look different. I don't know why I'm waiting for someone to really disrupt that because. How cool. We're not far. I mean, it's got another maybe 20, 40 years. It'll maybe just tops. show Facebook yeah. posts yeah. throughout the years. Yeah, just imagine I'm if you could for go. for a virtual, uh, what do you call those? Where, like a hologram where you know, you're know you talking to them. Just imagine how cool that would be to be able to go. I mean, we've got the tech now. If you've got that much content, video content, both audio, visual, written content yeah. for people, the type of, you know, Per, like you could totally put a hologram that communicates and interacts with you, and imagine if that was like you know what though That'd be a I'll trip. You know what though? So it does that. It'll pop up old posts, and not, like I'd say fifty percent of the time I cringe because yeah. it's twelve years ago, and I say something that I think is profound to my hundred family members, and I read it, and I'm like, oh, what was I? Why? Why would I even write? Oh about yeah, that? but I don't think of, I think of it more like the like all the videos that you're gonna have and the written content that you're gonna have when you pass, say you know forty years plus from now or whatever, right? So you you pass eighties, yeah. So or plus, I said, okay. right? So you live to ninety hundred hundred plus, and your kids will be able, I think, to be able to go to the funeral home and like hit a digital button and be able to see a hologram version of you and interact with it mm. and they'll be able to use all of that all the photos the memories the things that you say you don't well, say we've, we've been on thousands and thousands of hours of podcasts so they yeah. could very easily take the, your voice and your ideas and piece together and all the nuances yeah they could piece together and and create some kind of weird like ai version of us easily oh yeah. and i wonder I how, much, I that. how much this is a random question i wonder if doug could figure this one out what how much depression is related to a death 
How many people suffer from depression because they lost a spouse or they lost a mother or a father? Oh yeah. So imagine how 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 much that's going to help in 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 regards help to help bring closure, maybe. Yeah. I, I imagine you, you bring up a hologram of Adam at your funeral. Hey, everybody, thanks for coming to my funeral. Real quick, there's a twenty percent discount code uh, if you go to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's Adam. Yeah. There he is. That's yeah, good old yeah. Adam. Hey, hey, you, know, you, know. <laughs> yep. you got me. Yeah. <laughs> you son of a bitch. You got me. Yeah, again. There's Felix Ray glasses under everybody's uh, chair. I prepared for this. Yeah. Put those on because we're gonna play this video with a lot of blue light. When I say block it, uh, block it off. I just think that I think it's I think we're not far from that, and we're starting to see that with things like. Uh, you know, Facebook and their memories. And I, I think that's really- Well, you remember, what was that Black Mirror episode? Was it Black Mirror? Maybe something well, else. Well, Westworld where- had a little bit of that towards the, you know, the they? latest season. Yeah. yeah, where they had in your ear, it was like like therapy. Yeah. Um, and, and it was somebody that you knew from the past or whatever. Well, that's what really made me with. think that way was watching that. I remember that episode and going like, wow, we're really not that far off from that being a reality, especially for people like us who have this much mm. content. Like- what yes. what topic have we not talked about and you not heard my and you response? You could create a personality. Yes. Uh, you know what movie showed this perfectly in the eighties? Superman. When he goes and he builds his little, he goes. Remember, he goes to the North Pole or whatever, and he throws mm. that crystal and, and it creates his little base or whatever. Yeah. And then he puts those crystals in, and it's his dad, and he's asking his dad's question, but his dad's dead. Mm. So it's like yeah. it's a compilation of his dad's ideas and whatever can give him Fortress advice. Fortress of solitude. Yeah, yeah, imagine that, right? Mm. So I could be like, man, I wonder what Justin would say right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stop being a little bit. I'm going to make oh, everybody wear Justin. bracelets. <laughs> you know? WWJD. Hey, real quick, before we get to the rest of the show, you got to check out Live On Supplements. These are some of the, this is one of the only supplement companies that focuses on the delivery process. So here's the deal. Oftentimes you take supplements, they go into your digestive system, you destroy them, and then you pee them out. So it's expensive urine. Nothing actually gets to the tissues of your body that you want to improve from these supplements. Well, not with Livon. Livon uses some pretty interesting technology, liposomal technology, in fact, to get these particular compounds to your system. For example, they have a form of, glu- of uh, glutathione that your body actually utilizes. This is a very important a- antioxidant for your liver and your entire body. Great for the immune system. They have all kinds of other products. Go check them out. I like their B-Complex as well. Great, great product. Right now, if you head over to liveonlabs.com forward slash mind pump, you can get any one product and get a sample pack of all six of their other products for free, which is pretty cool. So it's the best way to absorb your vitamins and nutrients. Again, this is one of the only places I get those particular supplements from, Live On Labs. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Robert Bowers. One, what are your thoughts on partial reps versus full range of motion for hypertrophy? Okay, so head to head, if you were to compare, and they've done this in lots of studies, right? Partial repetitions to full reps. The full reps build more muscle and build greater strength along a greater continuum. In other words, strength is relatively specific, right? So if I squat in within six inches, I'll get a little carryover of strength uh, at the eight inch mark and nine inch mark and 10 inch mark, but it starts to fade the further away I get from that range that I train within. So full ranges of motion gives you broader strength and also builds more muscle studies. Again, they show this, but are there, is there value to partial reps? Yes, there is. You can use partial reps in ways to increase intensity and volume, but really should be saved uh, for advanced lifters. I don't think this is really anything that the average person should utilize in their training. I think they should always focus on full ranges uh, yeah. of motion. And if they can't do full ranges of motion, they should work on mobility so they can work. I think it's work. a novel stimulus. You know, it's something that you can add in after you've really built a, a quite a, a quality base, uh, you know, in your programming. But in terms of like um, full range of motion reps, you just get so much um, carryover functional strength as well as like usable strength mm-hmm. uh, versus just um, the the aesthetic side, but I mean, you can accomplish both things at once. And so I just you know w- would prefer like with clients of mine to um, go through the full range of motion as you are going to experience the benefit of getting stronger and mul- in in further in 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 depth in terms of the angle uh, that you're going. Is there ever a time? When partial reps are superior? I would say 
um, in specific ways like, okay, uh, I go to failure and I'm trying to add even more intensity. Well, I can't do another rep or at least another full rep. Now I'll add a couple partial reps. That's why I said this, I would save this for really advanced lifters who know how to utilize this properly. But for the most part, I mean, I'll tell you what, I never used partial reps in my training with clients. Almost never. Yeah. It wasn't something that was in the repertoire at all. Now, it, now I do, I do want to be clear, by the way, when we say full range of motion, that's very individual. Full range of motion is the range of motion that you have control over. So what that means is that if a parallel squat is your full range of motion, if you go outside of that, things break down. I'm not encouraging you to go deeper than, than parallel because you'll probably hurt yourself. But what I will encourage you to do is to work on the stability, stability and mobility that allow you to go deeper and get a full range of motion because you're going to get so many uh, more benefits. But yeah, people like partial ranges of motion mainly because it's easier and you can go heavier. I can lift more weight. I'm glad you. I, I'm glad you gave that example because I, um, that is the only time I can think that I've used uh, partial reps. But I wouldn't have considered them partial reps. I would consider them full range of motion for that client. For example, you've heard yeah. me talk about on the podcast, what do I do with a 75-year-old lady that can't squat down to 90 degrees? Right. And I've talked about where I'll take a bench and then I'll even put like a foam pad on it. And then she's only she's only squatting down this tiny bit and then getting back up. That would be considered a, a partial rep, partial squat. But that's the... she. She has only got that range of motion that she can control with strength, and I'm working towards getting lower. So if you're counting that as partial reps, even though I don't yeah. think that's where this question is coming from, that is the only place where I've ever used it with a client. There's one more place. Strength athletes will use partial reps. To no, I'm saying where I have used it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've I'm never used There's another way to, add, to, to utilize them with value. Again, it's advanced, but uh, strength athletes, right? So lockout, right? If they mess up on lockout on a bench, right. then they'll tr they'll train in that range of motion, or if the, maybe you're it's the addressing bottom portion. weak points in like yes. a lot of the compound lifts, yeah. So yep. you, you can like hyper focus on, uh, you know, uh, whether it's uh, the, the pull from the bottom or whether it's the lockout portion of it. Totally. You can kind of just focus on that, but also too with like. You know, sports athletes. I know, like you see this go viral all, all the time with uh, basketball players, like only squatting halfway down, uh, for instance, based on you know their lever and based on like where they're really going to generate force uh, the most. The coach is just kind of limiting it to that uh, and, and focusing on just generating force within you know what's more usable for them on the court. Mm -hmm. uh, and plus, they're like seven foot, so it's like you know it's yes, it, you it's a different, it's a totally different. Level. Leverage I mean, you, you might catch me do the, doing this like on, let's say, like one of our focus days in MAPS Aesthetic, and I'm doing, you know, buys and tries, and uh, I just did some, you know, full range of motion, uh, you know, cable curls, and then I'm, you know, finishing it off with, you know, four or five short little pu pumping reps, and my desired outcome is where I'm training hypertrophy that day, and I'm looking for the pump, and so all I'm trying to do is send as much blood and fluid as I possibly can in there. I'm not worried about the plus. I'm also coupling it with full range of motion bicep curls, so you might see me finish off like that, but it is, it's such a... Um, I, it's such a splitting hair difference on the value of it into your routine that you would never catch me training a client with it because I don't think it gives you that much value. But at the same time, I can admit that, sure, I've you've caught me probably doing that uh, here and there. In, Who's in the a, most guilty of, of using this technique? Here? Out of, of us? Of, well, I mean, not no, I just mean in general. Like, where do oh, you see it the most? Bodybuilders, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely, bodybuilders. What, what's the their philosophy with it? I guess. The pump, yeah, you know, yeah, because they they're so they are so focused on the pump. By it's the way, a, look, it's looking their at, strength and weakness, right? So yeah. it's like there's it's their strength. Bodybuilders, are some of the best at getting a, a pumping up a specific muscle that they want to yeah. target. Um, problem is they stay in that mindset. And that's why I was saying like, you might catch me do it. If I was like, Hey, I'm, I'm just going to pump the delts today. That's yeah. all I'm going to, I just want to do yeah. all these moves to get as much fluid pumped into them as but possible. That's not even, it's never, it's not even close to the majority of the way you train. Right. You, yeah. I would never neglect a, a five by five set of overhead by, presses by, though. By the way, this is where a lot of, cause a lot of, this is an unknown fact. Full range of motion, proper resistance training is one of the best ways to improve functional flexibility. Better than almost any other form of exercise 
because when you train a full range of motion, you build strength in that full range of motion. So now you have functional flexibility, not just flexibility, but flexibility that you own. Okay. So where does the myth come from then that bodybuilding or lifting weights makes you tight? Well, there's some truth to it. If you train in partial reps all the time, mm -hmm. you build a lot of strength in a short range of motion. Outside of that range of motion, you have little control. So you're really strong here. Outside of that, you become weak. So your body actually learns to move in a very limited way. Mm -hmm. So you see guys and girls with lots of muscle who train with partial ranges of motion. You see them try to do other movements like throw a Frisbee or turn, and they seem very limited because they've built a majority of their strength in these kind of partial short ranges uh, of motion. So that's the thing you want to you know pay attention to. But it, I mean, look, if your goal is to develop a balanced, strong body and you want to have nice, nice aesthetics, the majority of your training should be focused on full range of motion. By the way, I learned this first. Be when I first learned this, it was because my certifications told me to train in partial ranges of motion. No joke. Like my first certification told me, don't allow your clients... Uh, to come down below 90 degrees on a bench press yeah. or don't let your clients come down below 90 degrees on a shoulder press. Right. That's what I learned in my certifications. And the, the justification was, oh, muscle activation is the same and it's more too dangerous to go lower. And I remember when I broke out of that, mm -hmm. I got better results. My clients got better results. And then I realized these certifications really are just trying to mitigate risk as much as possible. Yeah. So they're going to give you the subpar way of training thinking that trainers are too dumb to apply it properly. So here, let's just do this. It's totally safe. But it was it was terrible. I remember learning that and going, why, afterwards being like, why did they teach me that? It sent yeah. me back like a couple and of a years. A lot of times, yeah, too, it was interesting because going 90 degrees or like just above, it's like a lot of times you don't even get that real glute activation yet. Oh, on a squat? So you get no. depth. It's yep. like, and you don't realize that until you actually work on that. So yeah, the, that was always something I would battle was the certifications just limiting uh, ranges of motion because it's a safety thing for them. Next question is from I am Sofa King Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck Good yeah. job, everybody. <laughs> what are the pros and cons of having a workout partner? Uh, oh, mostly cons. Yeah. You know what though? <laughs> I can see. So okay. So a majority. Think about all the years you guys have been working out. Yeah. yeah. What percentage of it would you say is with a workout partner, and what percentage of it would you say the, is on now? The very first quarter. Yeah, that's what I would say. That's, yeah. just, that's exactly what I'd and say. And then it was from then on out. Like, yeah. no, First no 25% of my lifting. You else. know what's funny is yeah. I bet you most people who've been training consistently for more than, let's say, seven or eight years probably follow something similar. Like in the beginning, they probably worked out with a workout partner and then eventually, you know, went off on the You know, I wanna, I'm the same way. I want to believe that, but I... I I found in the bodybuilding community, it's not bodybuilding community. Everybody loves to work out together, man. They it's like, they have a workout partner and they're about it, man. They they, they meet up with each really? other. Yeah, at, at least in the now. Is it mostly for pre contest or is it off season all, all the time? All the time, yeah, really? all the time. They all like it's to lift the together. commiserating thing or you're pushing each other because it's all about other? intensity driven. Oh, yeah. that's so true. it's real and it's actually as much an off season as it is in season. Off season, there it's all about packing the calories on, packing on the muscle, and you use each other. To pump each other up and, and I'll get after I'll tell it. you the pros and cons yeah. for me personally. So pros, it first off, depends on the workout partner. But if I work out with the right workout partner, it'll help me stay on track and stay away from my ego because sometimes my ego makes me do exercises that I probably shouldn't at that moment. I should Did you just do. say that the workout partner helps you not? If I get the right workout partner. Oh. So if I get the wrong workout partner, it'll do the opposite. Like if I work out with uh, somebody like myself – then my risk of injury just goes to the roof because now it's about... Yeah, that's what I've always experienced. I was going to say, I would, <laughs> I'm going I'm to challenge your way of yeah. thinking there because I think we're all... I would consider all of us, uh, you know, A-plus workout partners. Like, I know how to spot. No, 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 no. I, no. I know, no I, none of us are good workout partners for each other. <laughs> Not for each other. Not for each other. Well, then who are you going to get? Uh, well, Some uh, docile dude who doesn't know what no, the fuck he's doing? No. Like, what's your idea of what an A-plus fucking workout partner My is? My wife was a great one. When her and I worked out together, and mainly because there's no competition there. She's not going to lift as much as me anyway. We can check each other, and I have smarter workouts. If I work out with one of you knuckleheads, yeah. I guarantee within a few weeks, it's going to turn into, without us realizing it, the intensity is going to creep up, the weight's going to creep up, and it's, it'll be fun. But then somebody's gonna, you know, get hurt. So the pros are if you have a good partner, they can check you, watch your form, help you push yourself when you need to. It might be more motivating for some people. The cons are you have to rely on the other person's consistency and attitude and energy. 
And I take my workout so seriously that if a workout partner shows up and their mood is down by two degrees, mm-hmm. I don't want to talk to you ever again. I don't want to work out with you ever again. Like we're, you show up five minutes late, I'm on my own, go do your own thing type of deal. So that's the cons is, is I have to rely on someone else. The pros are if you get a good partner, they can make you work out better. Yeah, I, I'm going to stick with my original statement that it's mostly cons. Uh, the only pro uh, that I think is there's some value there when you're first starting. When you're first starting mm-hmm. out, and it, purely I see it as not uh, not anything that you're talking about, but just the commitment to get to the gym. I've made a commitment to somebody else that I meet them on Monday, yeah. Wednesday, Friday at 6 a.m. Therefore, I'm more likely- For a lot to, of people, it's like that. Yeah, I'm more likely to yeah. show up to the gym, and there's a lot of value in the, the commitment aspect. But as far as the training itself, I personally think it's almost impossible to work out with another person just because we are all so unique. We're all, there were so, the, everybody, everybody's bodies need something so individualized. Even if your goal is the same, both of us are meathead guys. We both want to build a bunch of muscle, but it's like my body type is so different than any, either one of your guys' body types. And my weaknesses are totally different than your weaknesses yeah. and my imbalances and my freaking issues that I got going on totally different than you guys. And yeah. so my programming should be really designed around what area, what weak areas do I need to address to prime myself correctly before I go into my workout? How was my sleep the night before, my food, uh, what I did previously in the workout? That should dictate my yeah. intensity and volume that I go into that workout. All those variables matter so much more than what does my workout partner want to do. It's also because you take your workout so seriously that you don't want to compromise for the other person to do the back and forth because well, you know what you need to do. Well, right? that's what I do if I train with like my girl or somebody. Like If I train with somebody else, I do end up compromising for for them so because oh, yeah. I want to give them a good experience sure. and a good workout. So what I end up doing is not what I probably should do for myself. Yeah. That's why I say it's mostly cons because most of it is centered around the hype, the motivation, the get there, to get yeah. to the gym, to push through, and those are all the wrong reasons yeah, to be going. I think we're, we're terrible people to ask this question. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be honest because I, I feel like we just we know too much. Uh, <laughs> when you get to a certain point where – um, you know yourself oh, like the best. You mm-hmm. know uh, how everything works. Like it, any partner you bring in, you're going to be compromising your time. Like you're going to yep. have to explain things. It's I agree. a pain in the ass. Like if you're in the same sort of uh, mentality as somebody else that's kind of just trying to figure it out, I think it's beneficial in that environment. Uh, just in, for accountability, I think maybe if that's like your your biggest thing, right? For sure. Like I can't get to the gym. I just need somebody that's going to be there and hold me accountable. It's consistent. Um, if, if you're somebody in that state of mind where you're reliant on that, like I find value in that. But, uh, for me personally, the only way I would have a workout partner at this point, uh, would be if I'm just learning a very new skill and for a brief moment of and time, they know it, Agreed. they, they yeah. know it. And that's I'm it. like, I'm just, that's picking such it a, apart. Totally that's, such an, that's such an anomaly though, right there. That's a, like, I mean, that's a one-off situation. And I guarantee there's people right now. Okay, there's somebody right now that is shaking their head no, and they're like, and you know what they're saying? I get my best workouts when I work out with my workout partner. And Steve you know, really pushes and, me. And you know that's the problem with it is that you still measure the success of your workout by how fucking hard you lift, yeah. and that is not a good gauge of what makes a good workout. Again, we know a too good much, a good training session is should be measured for what you need at that specific moment in time. And the the idea that we, and and by the way, I know this because I was the same way. I was the same young kid who thought like, man, I, my workouts are never as good as, as they are unless I have my workout partner. Because why? Because he pushed me that next yeah. level when I wanted to stop at rep five. And you know what? If someone tried to push me through a workout right now, I'd fucking slap them. Throw like, weight at them. Don't, tell, <laughs> don't tell me where I need, if I need to push more or not right now. I know what I need to do. So that's the last thing that I would yeah. want. But the people that are shaking their head at me that disagree with what we're saying right now are people that are still stuck in that mindset that it's all about intensity. I think some, look, I think for some people there's a lot of value because they, they, their workout partners, like it's like a partner and they work out together and they grow together and they do a lot of stuff. I get that. But the, the, the key is finding the right workout partner. For me, I hated it most of the time because I was always the consistent one, the motivated one. So it was like, I was always the damn teacher, right? Exactly. What you said was absolutely 100%, Justin. If I worked out with anyone now and I picked a workout partner, it's because I want to learn something. Like if I'm going to if I'm going to go through a whole mobility stint or I'm going to do a bunch of, you know, non-traditional workouts, I'll I'll ask Justin, "Hey Justin, can I do a 
sled and uh, kettlebell workout with you because he's good at it, and I'm going to learn from him. But otherwise, uh, I mean, not really. But in the past, in the past, I mean, I've had a, a few good workout partners. I, I think I thought, it's always one sided. It's never yeah. equal. Usually, right? It, always. Yeah. If you're in that situation, the guy who's teaching you, you are making I'm the out. Guy that, right. He's yeah. get, he's getting the shit in the stick. Yeah. If you're listening to this right now and you're you have a trainer friend who you work out with, well, yeah. Guess what? You get you are. That's a good idea yeah. for you to Buy keep him that, a nice Christmas yeah, present. Yeah. <laughs> keep that workout partner because your workouts are probably better because yeah. yeah. you have a professional that's working out with you. But guess what? His is probably suffering. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody is someone's getting well, the shit in the and stick. All, and uh, here's the other thing. Now, as I've done this for so long, now my workouts are so meditative and. You know, for lack of a better term, spiritual experience for me. I go in there, I shut off, I do my thing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk to somebody else or be worried about, oh, it's your turn or take the weight off or change this. I'm doing my own thing. Yeah. I'm in my own space, not talking to anybody unless I choose to. If I have a workout partner there, it's like, I, oh, okay, I got to go, you know, got to do yeah. my thing, got to talk to them. So it'd have to be really somebody special. <laughs> To work out with, like, we like working out around you guys, just not like with. Dude, I yeah. tell you, listen, I say okay, I say we're all terrible workout partners for each other because of whatever. We've all worked out at the same time many times. We never, I think we've only worked out together like at three times. Yeah, in like less, seven than, years. less than a handful for sure. Yeah, but yeah. but we're usually working out at the same time. Yeah, and that, I think that's great. So, and that's where I'm like, there's, there is a way to, the thing that I thought was the only real pro is the whole meeting there. So, hey, I'm all for having a person to help commit you. And then to after do you're done, get a, get yeah. a meal you or meet something. Each, yeah, yeah. Like, like, hey, I'll meet you at the gym, holding each other accountable, and then you guys do your thing, and then you meet back. And maybe some days you both happen to be like, oh, it's a light, easy day. Yeah. I'm not going to train really hard. Oh, me too. Or one exercise. Get, hey, yeah. let me jump oh, on. Yeah. I'm hitting those all jumping. Yeah, that's cool. Whatever, like, but... And that's actually how Katrina and I work out that way. So Katrina and I, if we train at the gym together, we do not train together. It's like... She has things that she knows that she needs to accomplish. She's normally running one of the MAPS programs. I have my my handful of things that I want to accomplish. Yeah. Now, sometimes they intersect. Sometimes, oh, you're squatting on today. Oh, I'm squatting too. We'll go share the, the rack together and we'll work out. That's our working out together. Yeah. But it's not me pushing the and trying her intensity or her yeah. motivating me to do whatever or telling me, let's go here. It's like, I just don't see a lot of value in it unless you're pretty, pretty new. Next question is from McConnell816. What are your thoughts on massage guns, cold tubs, and saunas for recovery? So all those three things I'm going to put in the same category as supplements. So what I mean by that is mm. let's change the question. What are your thoughts on supplements for recovery? Supplements are maybe 2% of diet and sleep and how you train in terms of recovery. Same thing with these things. Can they help? Yes. But do they, do they compare to the right training program, getting more sleep, um, you know, getting enough recovery between workouts. No. So in other words, you can't fix a bad workout or crappy sleep or bad stress with these particular products. I think that these are great in their own right. In other words, if you have everything's going good, uh, your training is good, you're recovering right, you got the right volume, you're getting good sleep, and then you throw in cold tubs and sauna, you'll get some additional health benefits from them. But I see too many people try to make up for overtraining or poor sleep or whatever with these devices and tools and techniques and think, oh, this is going to fix everything. It's not. It's not going to fix anything. No. I mean, I like the idea of kind of like, com let's go down this like path of comparing it to supplements because um, I, I can get down with that because when you talk about percentage wise, as far as the, the pie chart of what yeah. uh, you know dictates a successful training program as far as recovery and all that stuff like that it would fall in a similar category as supplements now my only thing that i challenge that is that supplements what i don't like about supplements now they're, they're cheaper you know like a bottle of creatine is much cheaper than a massage gun or a cold tub but the nice thing about those things is once you own them you have them you have them. You could use them as many times. Like supplements, I feel like it's like this. I've probably spent more money on supplements combined total over my lifetime than eat. I could own. Sure. I could have my own sauna, my own, you know, all those yeah. things in my house and have it forever to use that other people can use yeah. and get lots of value in. Um, so I prefer, I think to me, those are more valuable than supplements are, uh, especially since I, I think these are just a more natural process of trying to get your body to speed up its recovery. Um, but they're all, it's also a tool. 
And when used inappropriately and not correctly, it, you don't get a you lot of You know what the value is with these? Mm -hmm. The value of these things is to add them to a good routine, a good diet, and a good mm -hmm. sleep schedule and good stress management. Like, it, I've done this before where I'm like, oh, I'm a little overtrained. I'm going to add these things in thinking it's going to fix everything. It doesn't. But when I add them to a good system, it does enhance things yeah. a little bit. Like sauna does have health benefits. There's lots cool. of studies that show that, but it's not this huge recovery tool. It doesn't like, for example, getting no. more sleep is going to be way more impactful. Yeah. And it's interesting because I don't really look at these tools necessarily when I'm like physically like beat up as much as I'm mentally stressed. Mm. And, and that's a good point. I tend to gravitate and it just feels good with like the, the Theragun and, um, you know, those massage guns. Um, it's just something that kind of helps you to kind of, uh, relax your, your state of mind. And I guess, you know, part of that is sort of, you know, tricking, tricking, uh, you, you know, that signal. So you're in this like constant loop of anxiety and all these things that you're running through with your brain. I feel the same way with the sauna just helps you to kind of decompress, uh, the, the cold one is interesting because, uh, you know, the cold plunge, I thought was just going to be like an extreme kind of like, Oh, I got to like, you know, brace my way through this and, and grit and bear it, uh, which found out that's a terrible, uh, uh way to approach it. And that was something that is actually part of the protocol is you got to learn to not do that. And, and you you don't feel as much pain and anguish, uh, which is, a whole value in itself in terms of battling all this like mm -hmm. anxiety and everything else. Cause that's usually my go-to is to uh, brace bear down. Mm -hmm. And then you end up like pushing it down you keep it and, and it just stays with you and it just gets worse. Uh, whereas it's, it's a bit of a release and, and, and you know, realizing that, uh, you know, you fighting it actually like makes things worse. And so to acknowledge it and, uh, breathe slowly and get in a calm yeah. parasympathetic state is all part of the training. Yeah, there's there's benefits to these things, but I love them. Yeah. I mean, I I the, I hate that we don't have a cold plunge here. Like I I use our sauna mm -hmm. all the time, um, and I would use a cold plunge if we had a really nice setup for us to be able to do that. I think it would be amazing to do it before we podcast. So forget that. Like this person's asking about recovery. I'm like on the page with Justin. It's yep. like they're the mental benefits yeah, of agree. this. And the like, how, a performance enhancing that would be to go into the go into podcast. It's like a shot of oh, caffeine. Hell, like yeah, better than that even, right? I mean, the the feeling that you get when you come out of a cold plunge, especially if you have the contrast of a hot cold mm -hmm. like that. Oh, the feeling is an instant. Not to mention it has some recovery. But the problem with these things is the the science they use to try and sell them is is okay like okay yeah it could help speed up recovery i think they inflate how amazing it is it's like you said it's, it's a, a very small percentage. it's a very small, small percentage but i do think it has tremendous benefit in just how you feel Definitely. like I, everybody who's listening right now if you've never done this do this for one week report back to me on how just take a cold shower exactly in your shower with a 30 second to one minute minimum okay so a minute to two minutes if you can of ice cold water shut the hot water and see how your day is just mm -hmm. tell me how the beginning of your day goes for that week and i bet you 90 percent people report back that they were more productive mm -hmm. they had better energy they were more alert like there's a lot of good benefits other than just yeah. the recovery but, piece that they sell yep and i'll say this about recovery if you feel like you need something to help you recover first of all look at your workouts look at your diet you might be doing too much sleep Sleep is so underrated. Get better sleep or just take a nap or a couple naps. That'll do more for your recovery than any other tool you could do or add to your body. It's like someone's like, oh, I'm going to go do 45 minutes, uh, you know, sauna, you know, sessions or whatever. So, well, take a nap. Take a na If it's for recovery, take a nap and you'll get better benefits. Next question is from Brow Art. Is there any value in taking glutamine? Glutamine. You know, glutamine was a huge yeah, was. bodybuilding supplement in the 90s, especially. I used maybe to take it all the time. Early 2000s. Oh, yeah. So the, 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 the philosophy was this. Well, first off, they had studies showing that burn victims who were, giving, who were given glutamine would, would heal faster uh, than if they weren't given the glutamine. And so the bodybuilding community, of course, the supplement industry took that and said, oh, it helps with recovery. O plus, here's another selling tool. Glutamine is the most abundant amino acid found in skeletal muscle. 
So it must mean we can take glutamine and get all kinds of uh, incredible results. It, it doesn't work that way. Glutamine does help a little bit when you're under tremendous amounts of stress, when you're teetering on overtraining, but it's pretty small. It's not really significant. If your protein intake is high, it's probably not going to make a difference. Here's where glutamine can be beneficial. Uh, immune and gut health function. In, in many cases, because the gut actually uses a majority of glutamine in uh, repair. So what you find now is glutamine is more of a gut health immune supplement than it is for bodybuilding. Yeah, but, but is, it, is, the, is that all canceled if you're taking either a, a BCAA already or you're taking a protein shake or not you're hitting BCAA, adequate protein? Not BCAA because those are th three other amino acids. But if you took a... Oh, that's right. Glutamine is not in the in the BCAA. No, it's not right. even essential. It's, it's right. a non-essential amino acid. But if you took... If you uh, had, for example, in, in, in gut health and immune studies, they find that whey protein is beneficial. Whey protein is naturally high in glutamine and the branched chain amino acids. So would it give you the same results? I would probably say yes. Here's where amino acids get kind of interesting, especially like the branched chain amino acids and glutamine. If your protein intake is low, then you may benefit. So who would I have supplement with amino acids? Vegans. I, always. My, as, a, as a trainer, when I had vegan mm. clients, because uh, it, it was pretty rare that they could get their protein up pretty high unless they supplemented with protein, I would have them take branched chain amino acids or and glutamine before and after the workouts, and they would notice. So glutamine and creatine, then. Yeah, huh? it, creatine, glutamine, uh, leucine, isoleucine, and valine, right? The branched chain amino acids, and they would get they would notice benefits, or maybe just the essential amino acids, right, which include the branched chain ones. But if your protein intake's high, not really. Like if you're listening to this and you're working out and you're doing everything right. And then you add glutamine to your supplements, you're probably not going to notice anything. Yeah. By the way, since we just had the other question right before this, if I had to compare which ones I prefer, I would be I would lean more towards the sauna and the cold plunge than I would uh, glutamine. Oh right, yeah. Personally, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I would agree with that. You know, you know which amino acids I like to u utilize. My protein takes high, so I really don't supplement with too many amino acids. But I do like theanine on an empty stomach with caffeine. That's a totally different. Uh, thing though. Oh, yeah. You got me to fall in love with that. I really yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah. But other than that, um, amino acids, you know, if your protein intake is high, not tons of value. If it's low, then you can find some interesting things with individual amino acids, you know, happening. By the way, you can take too many, by the way. Like too many branched amino acids can cause reductions in serotonin because right. of the way you they get compete. Depressed, right? I've heard. Yeah. Because they compete with the production of, uh, of serotonin uh, with tryptophan, I think, which is part of that creation. And so they'll find, like, I used to do this. I would drink branched amino acids all day because I thought, oh, I, the more the merrier. And I was kind of like- People are still doing that. I know. I, yeah. Literally, I'd have a jug of water and I'd pour my beer, and that was it. I'd drink it all day long. And I was kind of flat. I noticed I needed more caffeine. Then I learned about that and I'm like, oh, okay. I think I'm taking uh, too many. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness goal. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal. And Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. 